Hi there, students, and welcome back to My Roar History with Dustin Fowler. And uh, in the last video, I kind of lied to you and said we we're going to move on and look at Asian exploration at this point. But yet, there's still one thing that I hadn't talked about yet, and that is the global interactions and the slave trade. And so we wanted to look, really look at this because I, I can't fail to go over these, these interactions that began to take place between the Eastern Hemisphere and the Western Hemisphere, because it's really important, and, and in a lot of ways, it kind of set the foundation for modern economics and our, um, you know, our, our political structures in, in many, 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 many ways. And if you guys are, are ever going to study geography or have already done so, you'll see this again whenever you're studying um, economics, um, global interdependence or globalization, and also um, world politics. But nevertheless, uh, let's look at slavery. The, the concept of slavery is nothing new. All right? So I mentioned in one of the earlier videos that the Portuguese had begun to um, sell captured uh, Africans as slaves to Europeans to bring, in order to have uh, have them do some of the agriculture that was taking place on the plantations in the new, in the new world. But slavery had been nothing new at this point. I mean, you read the, the 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 Bible and you talk about the enslavement of the Hebrews by the Egyptians, or if you look at some of the uh, the Greeks had had slaves that were often uh, maybe conquered people, or and many other civilizations had done this as well. Now, the thing that makes this kind of slavery completely different, and, and what you need to know about it, is that it is entirely when it's all said and done, it's entirely based upon race. Um, when it comes to the the Europeans, and partly when it comes to the justification of the slave trade, and so um, what I mean by this is is uh, and I mentioned here justify just, excuse me justifies using slaves to fuel the European empires economically, but um, and, and we look at God, glory, and gold. Not only were uh, many of the of the African captives they they were not necessarily Christian, uh, uh, which is part of the justification there as well. But also um, they used scriptures to justify it by race. They also used the idea of um, later on we're going to learn a little bit about this um, this uh, about Darwinism and uh, social Darwinism as the application of of, of survival of the fitness, uh, if you will, to human beings. And so there was all kinds of different ways to use that notion as a way of justifying the slavery of other human beings as well. But uh, uh, traditionally, slavery was, was conquered people, as I mentioned. In this era, slavery was simply an, you know, a part of the economic structure of the triangular trade system that's going to emerge. And it was seen as necessary in order for the colonies to be productive because I mean, come on, one of the main ways you're going to try to save, or I guess make more money, is by saving money on marginal costs. And if you don't have to pay your laborers to do the work, um, that's an economic win, but at a huge social cost for, in particular, Africa, but I think the world as a whole. So, here's the another thing that you need to know, is that African empires saw Europeans as a, or European weapons as a means to defeat African enemies. Now, listen, this is super important. Just like you always look at European history and you see where Europeans fight each other all the time, historically, in the same way, African empires were looking at trying to figure out a way to get an edge over other African empires. They had enemies in Africa. And so Africans wanted access to European weapons, in particular uh, guns, so that they could conquer their enemies. Now, when those African empires acquired European guns, they would go in and defeat their African enemies, and those would be the ones that were sold as slaves to Europeans. All right, so what I want you to take from this is that Europeans did not go in and you know, traverse the mainland Africa. They they didn't have the technology or the or the means at this time to infiltrate the interior of the African continent. Other Africans were the ones who were uh, uh, taking African captives, and then they would sell them to Europeans in exchange for a gun. So in a, in a way, some of these large, powerful African uh, kingdoms in conjunction with, uh, you know, with their greed and with the European greed, all these things kind of collectively uh, led to what we're going to see as the, the um, slave exchange during this time period. 
So in order to get more gun, I, I kind of highlighted this right here. Um, oh, my pen's not working right. Kind of highlighted this right here. In order to get more guns, Africans trade their enemies to Europeans. By this logic, it's a win-win. Europeans needed laborers in order to make plantations profitable. Africans knew how to farm and resisted diseases. Remember, we talked about how natives, Native Americans, uh, Na Native Americans uh, were not good at this because they they uh, were not able to uh, they were succumb to the European diseases. Also, Native, uh, Africans didn't know the terrain. Native Americans could could uh, run. They could resist. They knew their own terrain very very well. Which is another thing that I meant, I didn't mention in, when we talked about encomienda, but this is here's another reason why Europeans preferred Africans as slaves in the Americas because they didn't know the terrain. Africans also, because of race, stood out way easier in the Americas. All Africans that were there, every single one of them, were supposed to be a slave, and so therefore they could easily be caught because they couldn't hide. There was nowhere for them to go, to get away. So, um. As an economic, uh, uh, um, if you look at it economically, this one here was a big win for the Europeans, and it also was a big political win, like I said, for these African empires. So this is going to be uh, one of the the legs of the triangular trade system, which was our first global trade network. And later on, of course, we're going to talk about um, we're going we're going we're going to talk about globalization. Uh, this one here was really the the beginning of what I'm going to call globalization. Now you have uh, uh, the the um, the Silk Road and then the, the cross uh, continental trade that was taking place in the old world, but I wouldn't call that globalization because it's not global in scope and scale. So this here really is the first time you're going to start seeing globalization by the definition that we're going to use um, in, in, in world history and geography. Now, uh, the transatlantic slave trade, like I said, was the third leg of the of the triangular trade network. And this is a triangular trade network. So let's look at this area here as the first part. So so countries in Europe are the ones who are wanting to get to prosper, the ones who are wanting to benefit. These are the ones who initiate this whole trade network. All right. So so what they're going to do is is they're going to follow this trade network uh, to a T in order to make them as profitable as possible. So what you see here is um, things like manufactured goods, iron, beer, clothes or cloth of any kind and guns their 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 valuable manufacturers are going to be uh first sent perhaps to uh to the african uh gold coast which is this area right here um this is also where sla the slave trade would have emerged um and from there uh, there, you know africans are going to be sending uh, or they're going to receive different types of spices and hardwood hardwoods and things like this gold that's going to go back to the motherland, all right, back to the, uh, the 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 kingdoms that are initiating this trade network, and then you've also got uh, uh, more of these, uh, you know, obviously slaves going into the Caribbean, so that they can fuel the economic productivity of the plantations that exist in the Caribbean. It was mainly tropical crops, like sugar, was the main thing here. If you look into this region here, it was more like cotton and tobacco and things like that that was being produced, uh, because. Frankly, the climates in this region here, this, these are part of the tropical regions that are going to be able to grow crops that just can't be grown in other parts of the world. We still see this in modern agriculture where some of the developing nations along you know, between the Tropic of Capricorn and Tropic of Cancer are able to produce many of the crops that we use today, such as coffee and cocoa, that uh, have to be grown in those regions and then sold to us. So it was no different back then. And then... Obviously, your other raw materials, such as whale oil that was used for um, for lights and also for maybe a source of fuel, lumber, furs from France, um, rice, silk, indigo, tobacco, all these cash crops, um, and sugar, molasses, and wood would have been sent back to the motherland so that they can be used for creating manufacturers that would then be, you guessed it, sold to the Gold Coast and also, as you can see here, sold back to the colony. So it really and truly was a triangular trade network that was meant to make the, the Europeans um, more rich and more economically productive and included the slave trade here, which we're going to call the Middle Passage. And that brings me to right here, the Middle Passage. So let's take it down. The middle leg of the triangular trade system is the Middle Passage. It is a the terrible journey of enslaved Africans to the Americas. 
about 20% of the enslaved Africans are going to die on the trip alone. And you can see here the, the uh, crazy and just inhuman uh, uh, circumstances that they had to endure uh, you know, on the whole entire cross across, you know, trip across the Atlantic. These right here, if uh, you know, you could blow this up. This right here is a um, is a uh, chart that shows um, one of the like an example of a boat. This here would have been the inside. This here would have been maybe a different layer. And you can see that this, these little black lines. These are actual people that are lined up this closely to one another, and there's not even enough room to move. Uh, and, and, and so you can imagine that disease was rampant. People would get sick. They would pee and poop all over themselves. Um, and there's also other terrible stories of, of um, some of these Africans thinking they were going to be taken by these European cannibals and, and actually eaten. And so some of them were terrified that they were going to endure a certain death and that they would try to jump overboard in order to escape that. Uh, also, Europeans would um, do things like make them dance or be shot in order to keep them in compliance so they didn't try to rebel on the boat. So really terrible, in incredibly terrible and disheartening kind of circumstances that would, uh, that would, that would happen during this middle passage. Now, the, as for long-term consequences of this slave trade, Africa, even today, is really is in turmoil. Uh, uh, you, you hear in the news where you got uh, different types of civil wars, different types, you know, different refugees from these uh, the countries with with corrupt politics, and you got all these, uh, um, you know, groups like Boko Haram that's able to emerge, uh, different ethnic uh, conflicts that lead to uh, you know civil wars and things like what you see in South Sudan and in Nigeria um, and in other places and in Rwanda, uh, and so. And so, uh, really, at this time, many of the able-bodied men, the able-bodied men, the best of the best, they never were able to achieve any kind of potential. So, if you think about inventions, and you think about um, um, things like this that were able to take place in other parts of the world, those things never were seen to fruition in Africa. And so, they just kind of stagnated socially and economically for hundreds of years. And then later on, in the 1700s, you're going to see it again with imperialism which is not the same as uh the slave trade but still was designed to keep europeans over you know, your your developing countries in an effort to gain resources uh this also was going to stunt african development because of continual warfare these um these uh african empires you know, basically just fought one another all the time uh you know and 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 between that and selling off their captives, they really did number on their social structure there. It's also is going to lead to racism, which is global in, in scope and scale, and we still deal with it today, especially in our country for sure. It's very obvious, but just in general, globally, you still got this racial, this, uh, this racism. But you, you do also have a degree of cultural blending. I live in South Carolina, and you've got really rich uh, cultural legacy in the uh, in the Gola uh, 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 islands on the on the coast now they're, they're under um, attack by the forces of globalization but um, there's a lot of really cool really rich cultural blending that occurred as a result of this as well and that's just one of many examples and so there there are many different examples that you could look at of the cultural blending so what I want to do now is I want to talk about global interactions. Uh, in the in the in the Columbia Exchange, and I guess I'm just going to go ahead and build this onto the same video, and make it a little bit longer. Um, but it really does have to have to do with the same thing. All right, we're looking at global interactions. The, you know, remember the word globalization. And what you're looking at here is is not so much the slave trade as much as the exchange of ideas and goods that are going to emerge and they're going to take place during this time period, known as the Columbian Exchange. The Columbian Exchange. All right, you can see here that one of the first things that really are going to stand out to us is these different types of vegetables and food items that that came from one side of the world into the other and then over this way kind of the same thing so one of the things you're going to notice right off the bat is a lot of the vegetables and spices and things like well, it really mainly the, the vegetables that we use um, are going to have emerged in north america squash which is going to include pumpkins, turkeys, sweet potatoes, avocados, peppers, uh, quinine, which was used against um, as a cure for malaria, all right? Um, pineapples, any kind of citrus, well, I, no, that's not true, but um, your pineapples, uh, tomatoes, corn, corn is one of the, the, the biggest um, grain items today globally. Uh, many of these came from the Americas, all right? Corn, by the way, was always called um, maize, 
maize. In most of the world today, it's still called maize. And then over from Europe, you have uh, 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 things like citrus fruits and sugar cane and uh, honeybees and all these different things. We think about these, you know, honeybees and, and citrus fruits, and grapes, bananas in particular, uh, sugar. These are all things that, peaches and pears, these are things that we largely tend to associate with the Americas because they were, they're produced, oranges are produced in Florida, sugar is produced in the Caribbean, um, tobacco is, well, tobacco is, um, it actually, actually comes from the Americas, not a good example. Grapes are produced in California and other places in here. Uh, these are because there's a lot of places, even though these crops originated in, in, in Europe, there are many places in the Americas that have a suitable climate, even a better climate for the growth of many of these things than the places that they may have originated. And so, uh, and, and so you have seen this transfer of goods. You, you also, unfortunately, see, as we mentioned in one of the earlier videos, this transfer of diseases. And so European diseases really wrecked, wrecked North America um, in terms of the inhabitants once Europeans um, arrived. And, and some of the main ones here would have been um, smallpox and measles, but we all know about influenza, the flu virus. Uh, there was a and flus come sometimes in full force and do a lot of damage. And people do die uh, every year of flus. There's been some years like the uh, 1918 Spanish flu where, where more people died in that flu worldwide than they died in World War I. Um, you've also got things like whooping cough that uh, I don't know if you guys have ever heard a baby get that, but it is terrifying. Uh, and, and it's not so much of a threat to uh, adults as much as it is to, to babies who could die from it. And so all this kind of led to all this exchange back and forth and all these different types of goods kind of led to different types of economic systems. Now, uh, uh, capitalism is when merchants were able to act without government interference, which would enable them to obtain great levels of wealth. This starts to kind of emerge during the time period, and, and really it's hard to police these exchanges and so uh, uh governments would tend to just let people do what they would do they would do what they would do um and, and it was usually profitable for the governments as well joint stock companies are going to be companies uh that work kind of like large corporations today uh so individuals would be able to buy shares of a company and they could profit when the company profits or they could also lose the investment if the company failed much like you would see with corporations today and then finally, mercantilism was was mainly really was the economic structure. It was it was the it was the primary economic structure of the age of exploration. Um, and and I'm gonna write that primary um, economic structure. And it was centered on the idea of getting as much wealth or as much gold as possible. All right, so no country wanted to wanted to spend all their gold on goods from another country, that would mean that that country would get gold. And so the idea here was to bring in as much gold as you possibly could. Um, wealth was kind of seen as a measure of how much gold a country was able to have. And so the Spanish were able to directly obtain uh, gold by conquering territories. And the British were the best example of a country that was able to obtain gold through trade. So really, the, if there really is anyone who would become the masters of mercantilism, it was going to be the British. They were the masters of mercantilism. They were the best at this because they established the colonies. They didn't discover empires that just had tons of gold that they were able to straight take directly. But they were able to take gold from other European countries by bringing in raw materials that they then turned into manufacturers that other Europeans would pay gold for. And that's what's going to really kind of get the the, the, the British on the map as one of the dominant uh, countries in, in Europe going into the 17 1800s all right so uh that right there is is it on the global interconnectedness that occurred the global i guess the emerging globalization that occurred during the age of exploration in the next video this time for real we're going to look at um asian exploration and kind of look at what was going on in the other side of the world thank you very much